feel wonderful. Um, thank you very much, and good morning. So I feel a little tricked into this because Lorenzo said it's a small um, neuroimaging meeting of Tonya's neuroimaging group, and that sort of got out of hand. Um, second disclaimer, um, I'm not trying to be the new John Ioannidis. Uh, that is very clear. Rather, I'd like to work, you know, let's just make a living out of criticising other people's work. I'd rather um, work together with you and have been on how to improve things, at, firstly, locally and generational. Um, secondly, this was a talk which I gave, and I'm happy to disclose that, in the Human Brain Mapping as an educational session. And it was just a short talk. And what I did for that occasion, I listed, and that's why this sort of, sort of dramatic title, um, My Seven Hobby Horses Which Go Wrong in Imaging Research. So that's not meaning that I'm not going to elaborate in much in detail. I think we should elaborate in discussion. There wasn't much discussion. It was at 8 o'clock on uh, Pentecost morning session, so all the Italians were asleep. Um, but uh, it's meant to be a discussion, so I'm not sure we can in this small imaging meeting have a good discussion, but let's try. Okay, so just the conflict of interest which I have, it's partly influenced by my work on the ABCD study advisory board, which is, if you don't know it, the largest neuroimaging study uh, conducted um, with one protocol uh, cohort, if you wish, so uniform cohort study conducted. It's an adolescent study um, ongoing. And in a way, you could say we're still bigger, but that's how you count the images and the study. Um, this is a study of 11,000 children. So then I've worked in Generation R, as you said, and much of my examples, which fits nicely here for this, in a way, was you know, neuroimaging. You could take, from child psychiatric imaging, you could take example from adult imaging and other fields of brain imaging. Okay. It's very important to realize that I was one of the investigators in my sort of postdoc years, certainly, um, working on genetic studies, candidate gene studies, and that sort of a period. I didn't do that much, I can tell you, but it was a colleague who was also a postdoc or a PhD student uh, at that time, a Spanish visitor who had the task, and we sort of worked together a bit, or at least I followed her because we always had dinner together, lunch together. Uh, she worked on genetic studies of major depressive disorders. That was the candidate gene high. And essentially, she had to do a review, and her supervisor, of course, Cornelia von Dyne, and she said, this is a wonderful meta-analysis because every day I run the sort of search and there's new studies. And so she kept busy, and it's kept her. She got it into like a psychiatry eventually, but it sort of was a terrible enterprise because every day, honestly, there was something published, and it was a huge hype to find the genes. Now, if you look back at that work, which we summarized in 2008, which was just the tip and the top of it, nothing much hardly a handful of these hundreds of associations replicated and held. All of that was considered wrong. It was a disaster for a generation, and she left research completely frustrated. She said, I'm not going to ever do this again. What's, what are we doing here? Um, so, and the mistakes we sort of, in hindsight, um, saw happening in candidate gene genetics, which are largely gone in GWAS, essentially gone. That's a very interesting development. was sort of Within three years, they disappeared, these type of studies in that way, largely, at least with impact, um, have been very informative to my and other people thinking of what's going wrong, wrong in neural imaging because we're following essentially the same. And it's very interesting to see, uh, again, the same happening in EVOS studies, epigenetic studies, just faster. So we've started with candidate EWAS studies, let's say, five, seven, ten years ago, whatever you, however you count it, and you now it's come in the consortia, the underpowered consortia is the first step, so like the underpowered GWAS studies, and then we'll find the good one. And it's sort of a disaster that we sort of do it again and again, and you wonder also, like really in a philosophical way, why we do it. So I think, and now to turn to positive, Generation R, but also the Rotterdam study, are ideally suited to do it better. You know, honestly, ideally suited. Uh, however, we have to hold ourselves, I would argue, to a proper standard. Welcome. To a proper standard. And I'm not so sure we're always doing it. We're partly doing it. We're sort of in... Cons and I know that Tonya and others, we're really trying well with our groups. But sort of let's summarize where I think it went wrong or it goes wrong and what are the main ingredients of it going wrong. And just, you know, um, this is sort of just the candidate gene studies. You can go into that. I think uh, Matthew Keller is one of the better. Hirschhorn is another one. So a wonderful reviewers of what went wrong 
came to Canada in there. So now they're still publishing it. Actually, they're still published, but nobody takes them serious anymore, unless they are based on Shiva studies, of course. And I don't know what people think. We can start with a discussion. What do you think was the main problem of the Canadian studies, or is that sort of already forgotten as an error? At least the older ones, Cameron is here, at least sort of not quite my age, but uh, he should know. Who else should know? What went wrong in the Canadian era? What you, that's the main problem. We don't agree. You know, scholars don't agree. I have a sort of very strong opinion on that, but it doesn't mean everybody has to agree. What went wrong? It was not, well, actually, that's a good thing in a way, isn't it? Why, why was it bad to be hypothesis free? It's right. Yes, it's right. Well, we, I'm phrasing it differently, but you're absolutely right. It's, we say that we lack biological knowledge, thus we cannot phrase hypotheses. That's important. We must say hypotheses are good if we know what we're doing. That's one thing that people said. I don't think that's the real thing. It could be, but that's a major reason. Any others? You can look at thousands of sites and then just publish whatever. It's data judging. It's, I think it's data judging. I think it's completely data judging. And you can actually try to show that. It means that we sort of randomly looked at hundreds of genes and in different ways and sort of published. And with the GWAS protocols, that's largely gone. It's so essentially automated, rigged, Rigid, so dumb, that is gone. The, the data judging is sort of very limited. Exactly, you sort of squeeze the, you know, us investigators into a sort of straight jacket. I think that's the two reasons that's very good. Underpowered studies, there's a few other things you could name. So two small studies would be, I think, another one. So most people in science would say it's two small studies, interestingly, not those two reasons. Well, the biological. And then actually, yeah, there's, there's more. So let's come to that, uh, the seven plagues I've got here is, that's the ones I think, now let's go to um, imaging, I don't think it's the same everywhere, so these are things I discussed, I had hardly finished this and I had another three plagues, but that doesn't fit into sort of the biblical image, so let's leave it at those seven, but you're happy to add more, and how can we address it? Most of them can be addressed quite well. And I spent actually more time thinking on the illustrations, to be very honest, than on the content of this talk. So I had lots of fun with that. Um, so I don't, yeah. Actually, I took out my favorite one because it was too drastic. So let's leave it there. OK, so one of them, no sampling frame. I don't quite know why this is no sampling frame. This would be the sort of cohort of um, whatever cohort you pick. Anyway, here we go. Um, basics of sampling. So uh, you can talk a lot that um, candidate gene studies actually probably were not were affected by that, but it didn't matter arguably so much in genetics. People now think that population certification and bias even affects genetics more than we thought, but it's not considered a main effect. I would argue that's different in imaging. And let me say one thing before I forget to say that. The bias in imaging studies, for several reasons, is worse than in candidate gene studies. So it's even harder in our field if you do imaging. And I'll tell you why I think there's two or three main reasons. One is the confounding is a different ball game. It's much harder. But then there is very little reverse causality, which is one of my plagues in... Um, so you know, the, the directionality, for example, is much easier in genetic studies because you know, expression may be changed by environment, but the genetic structure, of course, is not. So um, the other one is that the sampling frame, I think, in imaging studies is more important. And one of the discussions I would like to focus on, perhaps, because many of you are in the epilogical studies, is this debate, the population-based versus representativeness. Because although in epilogy, I think that's sort of a simple and old thing, an old hat, in much of neuroscience, people are really struggling what's more important and what do we have. So just be very clear. If you talk of Generation R and Rotterdam study, you know, for, for us it's very clear. We have a population-based study which is not representative, certainly not for the Netherlands, probably not even for, you know, if you're an Omol, it's not even representative in Rotterdam. What I want you to know is what does that mean and what does that affect and why is that important to do population-based studies or representative studies. So this is meant to be interactive. So I'll look at you. This is a good moment. Why do you think it should be 
you want to prefer? What is it? What's the difference between? What do you think about representativeness? So I'll give you a clue. If you go to ABCD, does it say it here? Well, I'll, trust me. One of the main goals of the large ABCD study was to have a nationally representative study. And they said it's of primary importance. And they're not idiots. You know, this is the head of NIDA that put it out together with three other institutes, and they found it extremely important. They hired some ethnologists, not really, I would say, but some whoever, and they said it's got to be representative. Why do they think it's important? It's very, very important. Because we in Rotterdam have put our money on another design. Let's be very clear. We put our money on population-based designs which need not be, and arguably aren't. Just to, be, to give you time to think. Look around there. What do you think? Anybody there in that corner? What do you think? Why is the representativeness seem so important? It's going to be, I have a thought of that. There's sort of the claim, even in open science, actually, you sometimes see it coming along. So you can generalize it? It's about generalization, exactly. And what do they, what, on what criteria do they make it typically generalizable or representative? Response rate? Well, that's another topic. Let's, not, let's leave it for that for a minute. Very good. <laughs> but let's talk about the, which, which sort of issues are meant to be. I'll give you one. We normally want, which is easy, gender to be 50-50. That makes sense if you do that. Lesson. You don't want 70% boys. But that normally happens by, sort of, that's the easiest of all. What other are we looking at if we want to study representative? Ethnicity. Ethnicity is one, exactly. The US is extremely hammering on that. That's their main focus. They want exactly as many blacks and as many Hispanics as in the general population. What's another one? I'll give you that, we can't spend too much time. One other one would be social economic status and rural versus urban. What if we do it in Rotterdam? We lose on a few of those, don't we? We lose on, well, we're certainly not urban, rural, that's not gonna work. They're all urban. What else? We don't have a, we, we, what do we miss? He's teaching Epi, I think, he's got a board already there. No, we, we sort of, ethnicity is an interesting one. Generation R, if you take it, has more variation in ethnicity than the, a representative sample would have. And what I'm getting at is um, that um, you really have to think why you want it is. I would, I would discuss it with ABCD people, and I discussed it that, and I want to make that clear. Generalizability is mostly affected by validity. You know, it seems boring, but if an invalid study, you can't generalize. And that's something they tend to forget. It's got to be valid, valid, valid. Secondly, um, the, what is the advantage of population-based? Why are our studies so strong, in my view? Why do we have an asset here in Rotterdam? Why is population-based so, I think, so terribly cool? Is that risk? I don't think so. Jeremy, why do you think, you help me now, this is an expert question. Why do you think, why does that Hoffman, you know, long forgotten, um, say it's going to be population based and who cares about it? That's sort of old, and it's not listened to in these, when you design these studies. And I do disagree with a lot of people. Any idea? Anybody who thinks so? Let's be very clear. We have a study. In Rotterdam, let's take whatever your favorite study, Rotterdam study or Generation R, both are population based. They mean they recruit from, the, they have a sort of study sampling frame, they define it's all the children born in one year, and we try to recruit as many of those in Rotterdam. Or we have a even closer defined area, we have the elderly people in one area, one district of Rotterdam, and we try to recruit everybody. That's called population based. Why is that cool? Uh, it could be more policy relevant. If you're it could be, but actually I doubt it is, if it's an onward. I have my sincere doubt. Rotterdam could be because it oversamples, if you wish, ethnic minorities. So actually you're right in a sense, but not necessarily because Omad would be hard to argue why the district of Omad is so policy relevant. You know, a bit of a stretch. That's much more. It's about, that's said some down about the response rate. Really what it is, is on this slide. So 
you know, the ABCD study, I criticized that heavily. They selected a random number of schools, and they gave information, they sent it out, they sort of asked who was interested, who would participate, and about 5, sometimes 10% of the families said, I'll participate. So it is representative because they went to black schools if they wanted more black. They went to schools where there's many Hispanics. So they got a representative sample on these criteria, but it was 5 to 10% response rate only, which essentially introduces potentially a severe bias by what? Not related to SES, not related to um, 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 ethnicity, because in a way you could argue that those people are represented. But what was the real problem? ones that they want to participate have some sort of motivation um, to sort of contribute science. Yeah. It's the self-selection which we have. So we have much less self-selection. And I don't think we should hammer that home um, in each of our papers. We should know it, but we can't sort of every time write sort of advertisement section why it's so population-based is so cool. But I do think that if you do imaging of emotion and motivation, Exactly what he's describing is a real problem, and you can show it. And you can already now see that in, gen in ABCD, at least we have the first indication that there's far less people with psychiatric problems than expected. So whether that has a different association, never mind, you know, at least even though they're so wonderfully representative, they won't get representative data on the prevalence of a disease. So that's introducing some problems. You know, how that affects brain associations, we don't really know. But here, they don't even care about baseline response rate. They couldn't even report them. So anybody who's interested in this most funded study, they don't. And even the Framingham doesn't do that too much, but that's another story. So I think this is the idea. And the other thing is, it could even be, and that goes into much more um, general, uh, that it could even be cool to have a non-representative uh, population to just reduce confounding. Essentially, with Generation R, we did that was the focus cohort, also a design which is not so much realized, but other studies, very famous studies did that, the physician's uh, health study or the nurse's health study, the physician's, physician's study and the nurse's health study, focusing on a specific group. So that can be much better than representativeness. So that's the issue of space. The next one I want to go in quickly um, is, yeah. They did. They tried to. They tried to. And even then, it's got lower... Yeah. Essentially, they wanted to oversample on problematic... Uh, uh, yeah, but that essentially was to counter the... Not to get represented, but to counter the effect of the self-selection bias. Did it work? Well, that we don't know. It's very hard to say. Because they don't have population base. They just got... They, they got representative as they wanted. They ticked that off. They selected... You know, you can do that. I just want to make that clear. Um, yeah, that's really it. I want to move but, on. But yeah. that's two different levels, right? So they, they in their invitation, they are um, representative, but in the actual data... No, even that, because they chose the schools on randomness. Mm -hmm. They didn't define a sampling frame. They essentially just said, this school wants to collaborate, this school is ready to give the flyers, this school is ready to give the flyer, this school is ready to give the flyer. And then if they said, oh my God, this is going to give us probably a white population, we'll go to three black schools. And that you can make your, you can then create a, uh, a population which is representative. Yeah, because at the point that you are correcting your inclusions, you are no longer randomly. Now, even if you, yeah, the question is what is representative? I don't want to define that, and it's a tricky thing because it means what do you want to be representative for? There's 20 variations. You could be say, we want to be representative for Rotterdam. You know, that's a definition thing. But it's more that it's not this population based. And I want to make clear that we have that. And it comes with, with issues, which we could go into. I want to go move on in, in view of time for confounding. Um, because I think it's a problem of imaging studies. Uh, another one is the confounding or extraneous variable, which is quite clearly tied to these issues are tied together. So um, if you think of imaging studies, in my field, the, most, the best illustration is um, the IQ of controls this is a famous slide of somebody who, you know, also a mock, uh, sort of a mock's work to sort of go through all the imaging studies of autism. You notice a few things. First of all, how small they were for many years, which essentially is one of the, I would nearly argue, disasters. But the other fun thing is to see the IQ of the controls. 
So um, this is one of my favorite slides of teaching. You see that these are certainly not probably representative of any um, study base where these autistic children might come from. I don't know what they're representing. I think they're all convenience, largely all, just essentially you know, taken from the street uh, controls. And what happens if you're, if you're situated in a university town, these children have an IQ of 120. So you could argue the problem really is, the dramatic problem is, if you compare these kids who have an average IQ of 120, you know, you wonder why autistic children have 98 anyway, but um, if you compare that, are you then seeing the difference between high intelligence and normal intelligence, or are you seeing the difference between autism and control? It's really essentially considered a disaster. And many people thought, well, we've done this, Literally, you could go on and, you know, 2006, this list stops. Um, but you could go on and on and on with these studies. And essentially, we've learned very little, um, some people would argue, with this type of design. And that is confounding, you could call it. So, and just realize, I want to illustrate that confounding problem with one of our own studies, but that in the big consortia studies we're doing, they are copying the GVAS model. And at the same time, the only two confounders very often they have is sex and IQ in the studies. And, you know, for many of the brain imaging uh, outcomes like ADHD, just to adjust for sex and IQ is not very valid. And I'll show you that very strikingly in a slide that um, Ryan did for us, um, where he sort of wrote a small chapter. He sort of illustrated the confounding problem with, you know, a basic model, which essentially is age and sex and in this case also ethnicity. So this is what you see in ADHD and autism studies, just adjust. But if you adjust stepwise for more factors, which we traditionally do and should do, this surface, um, I think it's a cortical sickness now, isn't it? Uh, surface area, sorry, that's wrong. It's surface area that's uh, depicted becomes increasingly smaller. And I think at the end of the time, it's just 40%. So much of the effect here is explained by confounders we normally never put into the model. And there's no doubt that family income is, you know, is a confounder in this model. It's just wrong not to put it in there for ADHD. What is interesting, too, is that, um, and we could go into details how badly we do it, in these classical um, cortical analyses, we typically do the basic model, then select the area, and then adjust a bit for confounding, which you can show is really really wrong. The first lesson, if you are in imaging, never do that. For many of that will be too specific, but it is bad practice. What I'm trying to tell you, if you select an area in this uh, sort of vertex wise analysis or whatever you do, you will find in the basic model quite a big area. And if you then export it and adjust a bit, it will not change much. If you adjust the discovery of that area, you will see it changes dramatically. And we have looked into that. I don't know how much you get the guess. I think eight out of 10 papers do it. Either they don't correct or they correct later. That's just a terrible practice. And I presented that to the epidemiologist and they said, oh, so they just cheat. That's how, if you, an epidemiologist, you would, it's just cheating essentially if you take the hard word, because it's wrong practice. And actually, I've seen it even in our, we do it the same with EWAS, we do a discovery of the EWAS, just adjust it for a few basic models, then we export the hits, then we adjust them. That is essentially wrong practice. I could give the names of our own papers where I'm a call for, so that's a bit embarrassing, so. <laughs> um, I'll leave it at that. So I told you, I don't, I don't have the talent for you, Anidas. I sort of do these things myself. Um, so this is directionality, another plague, and you might be aware because Ryan's published that neatly in this sort of, I make this point very strongly, this is a paper Ryan published in the American Journal with Supervision on Tonya, I think it's a brilliant paper, I think it's one of my top five generation art ever papers, I cited and quoted and presented a lot, I think it's a game changer, because, and I'll make that point very forcefully, Essentially, a melody we had earlier in the Rotterdam study. I don't know if you know a simple example of reverse causality or where we're struggling with the causality. You don't have that problem too much in Alzheimer, I must admit. But where else? Do you know one? We've also had struggles. It's interesting. I'll show you one from the Rotterdam study. Um, 
So here, what Ryan said is the simple question, does behavior change the brain, or does the brain precede the brain changes or the brain um, characteristics precede the behavioral change? And because we had already a few years ago measured two time points, we can do that validly. There are a few studies from the Rotterdam study, too, that do that approach. Surprisingly little do that bidirectional approach. I don't think there's more than 10 studies even from the Rotterdam study, although we've had, in all honesty, repeated brain measures now from, um, I would argue, perhaps it's 20, I must correct that. I just think uh, 20 probably. So 20 studies, but we've had it for more than 10 years, repeated measures. So that is quite a problem if you assume that um, reverse causality could be a problem. And here, it is very challenging to, to assume that. The first thing is, um, this is perhaps not my favorite model, and we did it with multi-level, but this is a cross-lag model, but it is very illustrative. So you've got a behavioral measure, and you can show, does it affect the MRI? Does this MRI measure affect the behavior? And the cool thing is, you've measured it at baseline, you correct for the baseline association, and then you can see the change over time. You can do that for different measures, as we always do. And I'll tell you, Two things that's very interesting. Here we first looked at subcortical because that's what we thought, subcortical, hippocampus, and other structures, that's where the music was. The only problem was that if you look at time one to time two, and this is five, nearly 500 children, you see that there is an 0.9 correlation. Essentially, and that's a very interesting detail, that means that we cannot do it because there is no change. 0.9 is as close as anybody can measure, no change. Essentially, if I put you all in a room, I measure you five years later, at your age, it's very likely that the order in this group, that you have the biggest, you have a bit smaller, and whatever, is the same five years on. So there is no room to show that behavior affects that if this is stable. It might have affected it years down the road, but not in this time and that's something which is shocking because if you take this interval where the subcortical structures are largely constant, for example, an interval from 5 to 15, there's not much change. They change up to 2, 3, perhaps a bit. Subcortical, the brain, other structures change more. We cannot do it. And how many studies have you seen that look at cross-sectional or even some now, you know, longitudinal, mostly cross-sectional or whatever, um, and say there is a change because here some adversity, some child abuse happened, and thus that's why this is smaller. It's probably quite crap um, research. And here, so what we do here with another matter, which is DTI integrity, like meta integrity, where we have a wonderful thing. We have a sort of 0.5 correlation or association, however you want to see it. It's the lag association then that means it's beautiful because there is some association. If this is zero, it's actually crap because then you're measuring the different thing. So you want it in this ballpark, and this is again in this ballpark. So you're measuring the same thing, but there is room for change. So it means the connectivity in the brain does change in this interval between the ages. I didn't point that out, but it was on the slide. We're talking about 6, 7 to 10, 11, 12. So there is change in that, and then he was able to show very slowly, that there is change from the behavior to the brain, but not from the brain to behavior. And honestly, that's not what we had predicted. That the behavior changes the brain. Now, there's good people that know that there has been juggling research and taxi driver research many years ago, giving evidence that certain behaviors change the brain. But on the one hand, we always do neuroscience research thinking the brain is an evidence of what is going to happen with our behavior. It could well be the other way around. And for me, honestly, I think this is a winner for Generation R and the Rotterdam study. We should exploit this. We should look at this. You know, Tonya and Ryan discovered it, but I think the idea that our environment or our own behaviors change our brain is not only cool, it's a good public health message, it's something we could really research. And the other thing is, if we realize that, many of the cross-sectional studies are essentially largely invalid because I'm not saying it goes only one direction, I'm just saying we didn't find it here, it probably goes both directions and even more complicated, but it's as, not as simple as we had hoped that the brain causes behavior. So um, that's that. And I had another slide, I don't think I did the right one on the Rotterdam study, I thought it was, or was this life course? Anyway, here we go with life course model. Um, 
that's a bit, I didn't, when I reviewed it, I didn't like it anymore. But what I'm trying to say here is that um, why is certainly child psychiatry um, the life course thinking or the developmental thinking, if you call it with a less fashionable term, so important? Let's sort of engage you again. <clears throat> Give me two reasons why we could argue that we really need to think of which developmental stage you're in. Well, essentially, one I already gave you is that certain structures change more in certain periods than other periods. That's one. There is all evidence that um, you know the brain changes until adolescence or even late. You know, we make a big point of it. But first of all, note that the change is quite small, and much more happens early in life. Or you could argue a lot happens at the end of life. Luckily, sort of. From your to my age, it's quite a stable period. I think I might be going down a bit already, but otherwise, no, we're quite stable. So it is a life course model. It makes a lot of sense to look at change in old age. It makes a lot of change early in age. That's one aspect. Other aspects, which make it very tricky. For me, the most tricky one is that the brain development, certainly the gray matter, and we must realize that, has a development across adolescence, which is inverted U-shaped, which means it's, it, it's smaller, it's growing, it's growing, and then it declines. So size and trajectory are very hard to align if you haven't got repeated measures, meaning that if you find an association, and we're really struggling with that, there is hardly any interpretation because of this development. So I think we really need to know uh, where we are, is the brain developing, and could there be this terrible U-shaped? And now, I don't know, we have this sensitive experience. I probably would have put it now in reverse causality, because that's sort of just um, from my um, time when I was still working mostly with the Rotterdam study data, and at that time we had repeated assessments. And this is a funny study because I remember sending that together with Tom Den Heyer, um, to, he published, I think, as a first author, he was sort of a mate of mine at that time, to biological psychiatry. And the idea was, is depression causing, uh, is the hippocampus a consequence of depression, or is depression causing a shrinking of the hippocampus? You know, even then, we didn't know which direction it is. Um, and we sent it there, and it was a sort of small study, and I think we showed there's no evidence that... Uh, a small hippocampus gives rise to, was it that way? Now I even forget the direction of effect, I can't believe it. I think it was that there was no effect on depression, and they said, you're underpowered, and we waited another 10 years to collect data to show that there was nothing. So, and then we published it in the same journal, which I've never done, sort of resubmit and say, I've waited many years to collect data, um, <clears throat> and prove you wrong, and, and he loved it. Um, so, and another one is, this is what I pointed out, is, you know, it looks like this inverted U-shape. I always imagine it when I read it. It's a really sort of U-shape of our brain. It's actually quite subtle. You know? Our brains sort of go like this. This is just to point that out. So this is my own work of the cerebellum, which has the same shape. It sort of peaks around quite late, actually, surprisingly late in boys. The cerebellum, a small part of the back of our brain, this is where the peak is, and then it goes down very slowly. So it's not this dramatic peak, but it still does mean, you know, if it's smaller here or better here, you don't know where you are, and, you know, smaller could be, smaller could just be that you're already further on this trajectory, so you could have um, advanced maturation or no maturational lag. So it's quite important to keep that in mind. Okay, multiple testing. You know, Data dredging, multiple testing, they're not the same word, it's different things, but they go together closely. They're good friends, if you wish. And this was multiple testing illustration. I would love that plague um, of this old slide. So it's a bit old-fashioned illustration, but it does the trick. Uh, I said the worst problem, I'm not so sure. Do you think it's the worst problem, Jeremy, of studies in neuroscience? I would go, well, I don't know about neuroscience <laughs> in general, but I would, I would just say testing. <laughs> you think it shouldn't be testing, we should estimate. Well, uh, I think that's part of the problem with multiple testing, we're just testing that there. What he's referring uh, to, if you don't follow, he thinks the threshold, the p-value threshold is testing. So testing is a sort of yes-no thing. 
I sort of took me a while to understand the difference between testing and estimation. And honestly, in my papers, I use them exchangeably until Sonia Swanson told me, what on earth are you doing? <laughs> um, so it's multiple testing. Testing is you find, is there an association? Not estimating is you try to precisely estimate it. Now, I also noticed that the open science people say exactly the same. Testing is really a bad thing. But then I looked at, up at, I did the fun thing, I never, you know, I wouldn't publish that, but of the people that, like George Davies Smith, let's look at somebody who's really sort of enemy of, not enemy, but sort of opponent in the discussion of substance. So he said, we shouldn't do testing, we should do estimation. And then I looked, he always said, it's not about the P factor, drop the P factor, who cares about the P factor, which, you know, simple minds will think it's quite helpful, actually, it's certainly in genetics, you know, at the end of the day, it's very helpful. But here we go, he doesn't like it. And then I look at when does he discard the uh, thresholds? When does he say it doesn't matter? And I can tell you, he, I found one example where he discarded the other way around, but nine of ten times, he discards the p-value if it's just not significant. <laughs> and then I said, bullshit, testing, and now I will tack it back. Estimation is even worse than testing. Okay, so with that in mind, do not do that simple open science trick that you say, we don't care about p-values, and then it's only to your favor. I want to see you that you have 50% and you say it's not significant and it matters. Fine. If it's balanced across your work by studies where you say it is significant, but who cares about this effect? That's probably the result of multiple testing. That's I discard and I write up the negative paper. They don't do it like that. So don't lecture me on my simple I am testing. You know, if you sort of estimate and you always have it in the good way. So well, that was, we prepared this, okay? But because we actually agree. So in all fairness, we actually agree. So, you know, this is the old most cited study of Rothman, I think, just simply because it's so wonderful if you rebut uh, the reviewer who asks for multiple testing and says it's not necessary. So write up the reference so that you can say it, that if you do multiple testing, you don't want to correct to keep your results. There's a 1990 where the most famous ethnologist ever um, said we don't need it. I always think that this was pre-genetics area and essentially history proved him wrong. Um, so I think an awareness of that is essential. Uh, I would disagree that, you know, I don't think there's a simple answer, and I've been struggling with that in my own work. So I think what we need is an honest awareness, and we, there's a few things that help, and I think that's what you will do. This is the opening lecture, I understand, of this riot club. I think what we need is an awareness, because this is something we have to deal carefully with, um, I'm not sure that always in all non-genetic studies the Bonferroni is the best or a simple false discovery rate is the best or now something that accounts carefully for correlations is the best. Um, I think what helps is careful analytical plans. I think it's, to be honest, I still believe in the big picture. Also, I still believe that we can publish negatively. Actually, my most cited paper is a negative paper because everybody says I find it and he didn't, so I have to cite him. So it worked quite well for me um, doing this. And that was a PhD study paper. So honestly, I mean that seriously. It publishes, if you have a good hypothesis and you have good data and you have good power, it publishes negatively well. So let's go through the points. It was, in my view, one of the main problems, and that was closely related to data dredging. Um, it's an increasing problem in multimodal analysis. That's why I do not agree with Rothman anymore. It was right, perhaps, then, but if we have 40,000 vertices, if we have 20, 120, you know, we have 150 different cortical or no, no, brain areas now. I think you looked it up in the Nature paper. They said distinct, functionally distinct, with some differences even. In anatomy, they make more than 300 areas in the brain. If we have that many, we have, if we do it sort of somewhat hypothesis-free, or even if we select a few, we easily have a few hundred driven alone by the outcomes. So it is, in the multimodal analysis, it's just a real problem, or in the omics, if you wish. Um, now, funny enough, if you go through it, the practice is quite bad. If you do the multiple testing, sometimes exposure, sometimes the outcome, Somebody just, my students tend to tell me just to show you that it does not work. Interactions effect shouldn't be subject to multiple testing correction. I strongly believe if they are primary hypotheses, they should be. So that is. But I'm not sure that I have the answer, so you can really work on that. Uh, another thing, yes, the confounder control should be there. Before you multiple test, I mentioned that. Um, that's it. I don't know what you want to ask or do. Um, yeah, so integrating, there's a few answers. 
I don't even think machine learning is the answer either. I'll leave that to you. I don't know if anybody has comments on that. I think it's a huge problem. I don't know. Tonya has been publishing on that. What do you think? Any thoughts? How to deal with it? Um, it depends on that. I think, I don't think it's going to pan out to what we think, and I think it's because of the noise of the characteristics of the data. But that's something that I'm still trying You mean that's a sort of... As far as prediction. Yeah. That's another one. Yeah. No, I mean, you mean specificity, or you mean uh, the multiple testing? The multiple testing. Oh, you mean... Um, Sorry, I was still with the multiple testing. So multiple, well, you multiple have to, testing is, is kind of a mess. You have to. Yeah. I think the best thing to do is, is to be transparent about what you're doing and why you chose for it. So there's different approaches to do it. Just be transparent. About it. The problem is that there's sort of papers that have no story and put it all open. They publish poorly in a way. You know, even Nature, you know, whatever you publish in you know, American Journal or in Neurology, you know, they want. A message and a story. If you just say, here's my data, you know, a friend of mine said, why don't we just send our syntax and our SPS output and then sort of a very small sort of, sort of bibliography and that's it. It doesn't work like that. You know, it does not work like that. We're not in that business and I'm not even sure I would be interested in it. So we do want the person that interprets the data. So that will give you the responsibility, which does not mean you shouldn't be transparent, but you must make choices. You know, do you think there is something here or not? Even if you estimate or you test, is there something? You could say black and white and positive, and it's not. It's a continuum, but it is a struggle. The other thing is realize that the people that think there is a hypothesis, it's also you know we have one hypothesis and others where we think this could be, and then even that is a continuum which sort of struggles. So it's here to stay, I think, the problem, and it's not so easy solvable as in genetics. Though I think um, we should be a bit more rigorous um, in what we present still. So I think um, we should dare to write more negative papers is my message, really. And thus, even if it's a result of multiple testing, I do think that is the, at least the sort of bottom line I would feel strongly about. Okay, specificity. I don't know why. I, yeah, this is the other thing. Um, epidemiologists... I would say early post-war years, strongly believed in specificity, and probably some of you know who killed the specificity idea in um, epidemiology. That was the smoking, understanding of smoking. All of a sudden, smoking was related essentially to 95% of the outcomes tested, so they gave up on the idea. It's, you know, and epidemiologists like Bradford Hill said specificity is one of the important criteria of causality. That's essentially gone. I don't think many epidemiologists of any standing still think specificity is important. It comes up all the time so that you find something and then, oh, it's also related to that and that is that and it's really not specific. That is, um, <clears throat> I think, an illusion and we should counter that. And certainly in child psychiatry, um, I'll show you why it does not work a bit and it is not never ever going to work. So this, uh, this is one of the old graphs. It's not what we like to see, but I love it. Uh, from Ben Leahy, who's a child developmental person from Chicago. He came up with something he called the P-factor, sort of five years ago it started a rage because he discovered, as many before him, um, how all psychiatric phenotypes is inattention of hyperactivity or um, uh, conduct disorder, and this would stand for OCD, sort of compulsive disorders. But essentially, he showed again and again how strongly these traits, if you don't measure them as black and white categories, are related. And he worked carefully on structures, um, uh, P-factor, or he called it general psych uh, psychopathology model, that shows that all psychopathology traits are related with each other. And he gave, essentially, child psychiatry, which is much more advanced than uh, adult psychiatry in this, and neurology, if you wish, um, gave up on largely comorbidity. It said it's not a useful term. Just realize that. That's a big advance. What we see is the co-occurrence of problems and this comorbidity that there is a main disorder and another disorder, like once we have is you have autism and you have probably a bit of ADHD. It's largely gone. Of course, the DSM speaks about it. It's much more helpful to think that you have a general vulnerability and you have autism and you have ADHD and not to think that one disorder must be of 
you know, a consequence of the other. For many years, people in the DSM thought, if you have autism, you can't diagnose ADHD. They gave up on it. They just now define it. Of course, they use the term comorbidity, co-occurrence. But it's, it's largely not such a helpful construct, also because it doesn't use traits as a continuum, and also because um, you know whether they have a joint cause or they cause each other is hardly definable. And thus, that means that we will find, um, you know, if you think these are complex relationships, depression and dementia, many of us would think that depression is not a real cause of dementia, but a precursor. But um, <clears throat> aggression, for example, it's important to point out, all of the other traits, with some exception of anxiety, co-occur heavily with um, aggression. So I think this means that we have very little reason to, to find um, uh, on a larger scale, or at least I would say more carefully, not that there's no specificity in brain findings, but it makes it much more challenging to find. We much have to carefully correct for the co-occurring traits. And if I'll show you, give you, can give you an example of that. I hope it's coming up now. Yeah, that's an interesting example. It's very theoretical, and you might want to read it up. It's just out in press. Um, work of a PhD student of mine, or postdoc of mine, has left. He defined in these 3,000 children of Generation R the white matter structure of um, um, different traits. So this is externalizing problems, think of aggression, attention problems, internalizing problems, and he showed that there was not much of an association, which is quite interesting. So there was no association, cross-sectionally this is, between the level of um, internalizing, well, there was a bit, but not much, and externalizing. What we then did is we defined a general factor. So that means it's a sort of construct, a latent variable, if you wish, or actually it is a latent variable. That's a construct of pulling together all the general psychopathology like a sort of principal component. It's a bi-factor model, so it's not really the same, but it sort of pulls it all together. And if you do that, we found a very strong association that more of that factor is associated to less white matter or white matter integrity, if you call it. That was very interesting. But what was perhaps even more interesting was that the specific externalizing factor at that same time also showed a signal then, an association. Now that means, and to point out two things, the specific externalizing means um, but let me show first the direction. This is more psychopathology, less white matter integrity. This means more specific externalizing is more white matter integrity. The direction essentially is different than we had expected. That's one thing to note. The other thing in that paper to note is, what does this factor mean? It means that you have taken the externalizing domain You've taken out all the really typical neurotic-like general psychopathology, and you're left with a pure, very theoretical, and actually not even diagnosable, externalizing factor. A sort of theoretical construct of externalizing without problems. Essentially, that's like extroversion a bit, or surgency. If you know the term, it was the highest loading was with surgency, which is so this, you know, quick and high. That is something which is not a problem, but it's clearly a trait. And it's not surprising that that has a different loading. What does this all mean together is that the, it's just one point here, the message for those who are not in child psychiatry is just that the complex interplay and overlap of co-occurrence of these traits essentially can cloud specific things. And it becomes very hard to understand them if you don't carefully control it. So there may be specificity, but it's not easy to find it because ADHD co-occurs with so many other things. So if we publish, or I would always say they publish, but it's actually also we publish on ADHD correlates in the brain, is it really ADHD or is it the co-occurring anxiety? The minute they don't adjust, we don't know. That's the message. That's a simple message. And this was a complicated example showing that it really is a problem, not just a theoretical problem. And then small samples, you know, I'll leave that to you. Um, there's a lot written about small samples. Um, 
uh, why imaging studies can be small. Um, yeah, I think that's simply a myth. You find literature on why they can be small and this debate. Um, but I think I could go into that. I don't want to finish off because I noticed that perhaps one thing is we're in good company. That's the end of it. If you look at child and imaging literature, then you can see that um, studies are getting bigger. I just this morning added MOBA, which I noticed is happy to see. They've also got 700, the Norwegian cohort. So this is the ABCD. We're quite good. It depends how you count us. It's not one singular wave, but studies are getting bigger and efforts are getting bigger. The summary really is, and this way you can type new problems, open science. I put that in the Rome lecture too, the p-value fixation. Thank you very much. That's, you can show it's really, it was there in the old version of just because I predicted that and the critical. I want to end because I think we have a unique opportunity here in Rotterdam to do a population of science. And the first sign is that um, it is uh, a wonderful data set. We have a wonderful ethnological training. We have the expertise. If we adhere to these principles, the big principles, if we address these dilemmas, we can do really well. That was it. Thank you very much. That's it. No discussion. Um, we had an interactive. Well, we had two, two minutes. We take or one question. Who dares? Yes. The last question. Yeah, <laughs> what 